so excited today because uh, if not for this person, we will not be connected to Convoy of Hope. So why don't we thank God? Thank you, Brother Rick Sorecki. <laughs> Let me just share a little bit. I know you're excited to, to preach the Word of God. Let me just put some uh, Heisman Trophy move on you. A okay, okay. little bit. How many of you have heard of Matt, Brother Rick Sarecki? Raise your hand. So half of us don't know who is this great man of God. So uh, Rick has an awesome story. He's not a follower of Jesus before, of, of all of us, but he was born Jewish and not a believer of Jesus as the Yeshua, as the Messiah, as most uh, Jewish people. There was one Jewish girl yesterday wearing the Russell, uh, Russell Wilson jersey with the, the service dog said, she's Jewish, but I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they have a very interesting conversation. So, and, and to make the long story short, she, he became a believer of Jesus because of his father-in-law who went to be with Jesus, who loved him to Jesus Christ. And now he's a man of God traveling all over the world, bringing hope and the love of Jesus through Conway of Hope, Charisma, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to us brother, pastor, my friend, our friend, Rick Sarecki. Come on, stand up on your feet, Charisma. Come on, stand up on your feet and honor the man of God. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Yes, my father-in-law, but let's not forget my wife also. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Uh, Wow, what a testimony from yesterday. The why we do what we do. We had the how and the why working yesterday. The how, services, serving others, groceries, inviting them. But the why, to move people compassionately towards Christ. Uh, it's just amazing. I also want to say thanks for the music. Wow. The worship here is outstanding. And uh, I, know, I know my heart's open, you know, but right? And I just want to say I watch online sometimes. But it's worth saying it's much better in person. Not to say don't watch online. Watch online, but come on in. Feel the water sometime. Come to church. Wow. Outstanding. Um, I want, I'll tell you a little bit. I'm going to set my timer also because, uh, like I said, mentioning my wife. My wife's not here, and she always tells me when I'm done. You know, come on. You married people, you know, trust your spouse. So I'll set my time, 25 minutes. And... Uh, That'll let me know I have another 25 minutes. No. All right. Uh, I want to say thank you. Oh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, So, like the pastor mentioned. So uh, I came to, I'm um, 62 now. I came to faith at 45 years old. At 41 is when I started seeking the Lord. Uh, I was raised Jewish. I still call myself a Jewish believer in Christ the Messiah. I uh, went to Hebrew school. I was bar mitzvahed. Grew up a good secular Jew. Went to synagogue on high holidays. Uh, if you asked me if I believed in God, I would say yes. Uh, if I believed in heaven, I would say yes, but I never gave it a lot of thought. If you ask me if I was waiting for a Messiah, uh, I, I would have said no, but flippantly I would have said, uh, Jews, we're waiting for the first coming, you Christians are waiting for the second coming. It was kind of a flippant response, but not to go deeper. And I uh, lived my life just doing good works. If things were good for Rick, they were good for everybody. Um, I married a pastor's daughter, Way too long of a story for now, but uh, I call it a wild romance. She says she was backslidden, uh, which is probably truth in the matter. She was backslidden, but who knows, God can take something bad and make it good, which he did. Uh, when 9-11 happened and the Twin Towers came down, we were married nine and a half years, and uh, on September 20th, I know that date because my wife told me, and women never forget anything, uh, that's the day she found out I was being unfaithful to her nine and a half years of marriage and um, in her pain and suffering she turned back to her faith and I saw an instant change in her that got me to ask myself what do I really believe I was 41 I say I believe in heaven I say say I believe in God but do I really and uh, I came to her and I said you know I either need to prove this eternity thing real or your faith false one or the other because I'm gonna live my life differently and uh, she was like, okay, you know, because she knew at that point God would work on me. She later told me she didn't ask me to leave because out of her faithfulness and obedience to God, she couldn't trust her feelings, and she didn't know what God wanted her to do with me. That's a godly woman. 
And uh, uh, the short version is uh, I, I went on a seeking process, which took me four years. And uh, through her pain and suffering, I came to my salvation. Um, she forgave me right away. Uh, but it took about another three or four years to learn to love and trust me again. And I came to Christ in uh, Good Friday service, March 05. Praise the Lord. And uh, that, that was amazing. And God was flying me around since then. Uh, I, I got introduced to Convoy Hope in 07 and came to Convoy Hope December of 09, left the business world. So that's a little background on me. Uh, I, I say I'm a fool for the Lord. Uh, I used to just be a fool, but now I'm a fool for the Lord. Wow. Amen. Wow. So uh, thank you guys. Uh, it's ridiculously good that I get to even be here today. Even yesterday, I think, how can this guy uh, who goes from California to Missouri with Convoy Hope gets to be in Seattle, just united with you guys in the Y and reach, reaching one more for the Lord. So I don't take that for granted. Um, it's amazing. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Also, a pastor, thank you. Church, thank you. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, my father-in-law. My father-in-law was uh, a former leader of the Assemblies of God Fellowship, Dr. George Wood. He passed away in January. Uh, after battling uh, stage four cancer. We found out actually about this time last year that uh, he had cancer and the Lord took him back pretty quickly. Um, but thank you. One of the things he loved, you know, pastor called me and said, what can we do? What can we do for him? And he liked these ices. You know what I'm talking about? Little cups of ices, flavored ice. And uh, so you guys sent him like this whole mo big case. I never, like the size of a pallet, a little less than a pallet, but a huge amount of these ices and that he actually loved those and it brought him a lot of comfort uh, such a simple thing uh, the ices were something he was able to eat and brought him a lot of comfort so thank you and um, there were some remaining when he passed and I thoroughly enjoyed those so thank you also <laughs> paying it forward um, also my mother-in-law God bless you my mother-in-law is 83 she survived him and you guys gifted her something I don't know if it was fruit or candy or what or uh, but she's still talking about it. She's super thankful and appreciative. So thank you. Uh, it makes a difference when we can just do something for others and the simplest thing. So I didn't even know you guys did that, or maybe I did and I forgot, but thank you. God bless you. All right, so today, uh, God put on my heart a message of battle well in our everyday faith walk, just battling well in our everyday faith walk. And um, it's interesting, um, my youngest son, Jacob, uh, turns 25 this month. He just graduated last month, got his master's in theology from Fuller Seminary. That's pretty cool for a young man. Three years before, he got his, bastard, uh, his bachelor's degree. I wasn't reverting back. It was just a mistake in my speak. Oldrick was not coming out. Uh, save me, Lord. Sanctification is a work in progress. All right, so, uh, but he... he Three years before that, he graduated with a dramatic arts degree from USC, which was interesting. So dramatic arts, master's of theology. And my father-in-law, who was very instrumental, called me right before he graduated uh, USC and said, hey, do you think Jacob would like to go to seminary? And I laughed. I said, no. <laughs> Why would he want to go to seminary? He's going into the entertainment business. But I said, you're the grandfather. You call him and ask him. So uh, about a week later, I get a call from my son saying, hey, uh, grandpa called and asked me if I wanted to go to seminary. And uh, I told him I'd pray about it and think about it, and I have, and I'm going to go. So I started laughing at him because I thought he was punking me. And he goes, no, really? And I said, really? I said, why? And he said, well, Dad, you know, um, I want to get closer to God. I think it'll help me get closer to God, and I think it'll help my writing. And he said, and a lot of people get their master's while they're working. And I went, wow, that was a really mature answer. <laughs> Good going, kid. And uh, he did that. So uh, he's, I, I would say he's battling well in his everyday faith walk in the real world. He's got a wide variety of friends of every specter, gender, and animal you want to be called. And he's Jacob, person of faith, and doing his stuff in the real world. And everyday faith walk, you know, battling well. The world's a mess. My oldest son turned 33 um, last month. Actually, Jacob's 25 this month. The other son's 33 last month. Uh, he's been not bad. He's been battling, but he's been in and out of prison, drugs. Uh, gave me two great grandkids and a da uh, daughter-in-law, uh, even though they're divorced. But three months ago, he totally gave up drugs, 
surrendered his heart to Christ, had Christ in his mind, but it took years for the heart. I, I think, you know, maybe some of you are there right now. I was certainly there. You know, I kind of felt what it was. Uh, and he's working at the church now, doing facilitation work. And in fact, tomorrow I'm going to fly to Las Vegas and see him and try and encourage him in battling well in his everyday faith walk. Um, on another note, in battling Interestingly, as I was waiting for pastor this morning at the hotel, I'm in the lobby, and how many of you know what the game Cornhole is? Whoa, whoa there's a champion over there? Yeah, yeah, old, yeah, old guys like us are <laughs> co Cornhole, the guys who couldn't make it in other athletics. Yeah, throw the beanbag into, like, across the room, slides up the ramp into the hole. There's a Cornhole championship on TV. Serious, grown men, championship, cornhole. And I'm looking in the audience, and it's all a bunch of other old guys, you know, who are the cornhole guys who didn't make it to the championship. And I thought, well, that's a way to battle well, you know, or to battle. And maybe the guy who wins it is a lover of the Lord, and he wins it, and he goes, I owe all this to Jesus Christ. Thank you. And he's the cornhole champion, and Christ brought him to be cornhole champion. Interesting, daily faith walks. Of battling well. Um, and I'm here with you, battling well. I get to just show up and also traveling, you know, you know, who you see, who you meet, what God might put in front of us this afternoon. So three things, ways to battle well in Jesus. This is not all inclusive. There's many, many ways to battle well with Christ. In fact, as I was in scripture reading about battling well, almost every scripture I read had to do with battling well. And I challenge you, if that's not true, uh, go home and start reading your Bible and see if it doesn't speak into your life on how to walk well, battle well, and relate well. So I just want to deal with three points. First point, know your enemy. Know your enemy. Our, battle, our battles are with the principalities of darkness. Not with our spouse, not with our kids, not with our boss, not with the teachers, not with the shopping center person. There's literally good and evil in the world and its principalities of darkness. Now I know some of you people we could rub each other the wrong way. It's not the same as battling the principalities of darkness. So know your enemy. Second, be prepared. The Bible says like a thief come in the night, we will never know the hour. Also there's great scripture in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 about putting on the armor of God. You can read that yourself. Pastor, I think I caught a message of yours a couple weeks ago that talked about being in pouring condition to be able to be poured out. Well, if you're gonna be poured out, you actually have to be filled with something to be able to pour out. Otherwise, you're just keep receiving. So how are we prepared to be in pouring condition to pour out, be prepared? And third, know the battle's won. This is pretty cool. The, the Bible tells us in Revelation, God's already won the good fight, the battle's won. So therefore, death is beaten, we have eternity in heaven, it kind of takes the pressure off. If we can go, hey, the battle, the, the war's won, we need to show up and decide, are we willing and available to be present now and wherever he has us? Whatever it is, the simplest things, the big things, and we don't even have to win the war because it's already won for us. So know your enemy, be prepared, know the battle is won. So I want to share a little bit about why and how, even though we actually lived it out. Um, this weekend, yesterday, which is amazing. Ephesians 6.12 6, says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, this, we need to know this and just simply fight through it. Also, the Bible says, Count it all joy. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and the steadfastness has its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, I want to tell you, um, I kind of had a hard time with this. You know, I still have a hard time with it uh, to comprehend. How can I find joy in everything? Uh, when I first came to Convoy of Hope, in December of 09, I started a month before the Haiti earthquake. That was horrific, over 300,000 people killed pretty instantly in the earthquake. I left the business world, 
to go into the faith-based based humanitarian world. Uh, my family are mostly still non-believing Jews, but their hearts are softening dramatically. And I remember my father called me a couple weeks into the uh, Haiti crisis. And as I'm telling him everything that's going on, he asked me, am I happy? And I thought, wow, what a strange question. You know, I'm t people are dying here and you're asking, am I happy? But as a father, what he was really wondering, did I make the right decision? Leaving the business world to go do this, and I'm I happy in my de decision. And I stopped for a moment and I realized, I'm not happy. I'm overjoyed. I was experiencing joy in the sorrow for the first time. I was overjoyed. The, the understanding of joy is much greater than happiness. I mean, if we're just seeking happiness, uh, you know, we get that happy little high and then we're on to the next happy little thing. But none of it's sustaining. Joy is sustaining. Joy is deep. Joy is, you cannot have everything go right and still be joyful for what we have. And it's so much more meaningful. And until it's experienced, and I only say this because some of you here, maybe you haven't experienced that yet. I mean, I, I'm telling you a story that I experienced at 47 years old. I don't think I understood joy till then, or at least started to understand it. And then my first year and a half at Convoy of Hope, I was seeing so much pain and suffering, I feel like I maybe suffered from depression for the first time, or at least an awareness that I wasn't aware before because I couldn't even share it with a lot of people. It was so horrific and heavy on my heart. And when you allow yourself to have a compassionate heart, you're going to suffer a little bit in that. But it doesn't have to be unhappiness. Compassion literally means suffer with. That's a good pain to have that we don't often afford ourselves or are taught today. So I now strive for joy than happiness. And I remember when I was going through the uh, phase of not understanding, I was, uh, uh, I was reading the Bible. I found every scripture on poor and suffering. And there's a lot of scriptures on poor and suffering in the Bible. And I was overwhelmed with the understanding that the poor and suffering are going to be with us always. And I was heavy. And my brother, and one of my brothers in Phoenix, I was telling him this. He said, yes. He said, the poor and suffering will be with us always, but it doesn't mean they have to go hungry. And I went, wow, you're right. I'll start battling there. Take care of their hunger. But I'll tell you, even with Convoy of Hope, when we're taking care of the hunger like you did yesterday, that's help. But hope comes through the church. So we always try and partner through the local church and the community. So where we give help, we want to instill hope because hope is sustaining. And that's what changes people's lives. That's what changed my wife. Changed my wife. Changed my life. Changed my wife, too, probably having hope. <laughs> so why do we battle well? Why, do we, why should we battle? It's simply to move people more compassionately towards Christ. Some of you are here, and maybe you have uh, an idea. Maybe you're not in a relationship with Christ yet. You have kind of an understanding. And I'll just tell you the prayer. When I was a non-believer, I had people pray for me. I never found prayer offensive. It never bothered me when people wanted to pray with me. With me was better than for me. I thought, I'm going to pray for you. That wasn't always good, you know. But uh, we're, you're in our prayers was much more loving than I'm praying for you. Just saying. I didn't understand it, but it wasn't offensive. And now I look back, and I remember, I would tell you, I would challenge, I think I remember everyone who prayed for me and everyone who gave me opportunity to partner and experience. So why do we battle well? Why should we battle well? Well, in Luke 4.18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And another verse why, which I skipped over, but we can go back to, is Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why should we do this? Luke 4:43. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Why? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. These are all great reasons and statements of why to battle well. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, amen. Thank you, and amen. Praise the Lord. So I remember when uh, I was 
Hal Donaldson, the founder of Convoy Hope, was looking for me to come work for Convoy of Hope or mentioning for me to pray about it. And he really wanted me to help create awareness outside the church world, the corporate world. What he wanted me to do is raise funds in the corporate world. I did not want to raise funds in the corporate world. I wanted to sweep the warehouse or serve some other way. I didn't understand what he was asking. But then as I was praying about it, God put on my heart, this man has an anointed vision from God. He's asked me to come alongside, and I surrendered. I said, I'm willing to do whatever he wants me to do. I don't have to understand it all to battle with him and do what he wants me to do. So I already had a yes in my heart before I sat down with him. But he didn't know that for sure. And he asked me, he said, Rick, how would you like to meet with individuals, heads of corporations, church leaders, to share the passion and vision of Convoy of Hope so they might be able to partner with us and maybe, just maybe, we'll reach one more for the Lord. I said, oh yeah, hell, I want to do that job. Yeah, that's the job I want to do. It has nothing to do about fundraising. It's about moving people compassionately towards Christ in whatever we do, whatever our work is, whatever our calling is, wherever we're going to the grocery store, paying the cashier across the counter, it's those opportunities. And I hope today somebody's moved closer to the Lord, just from hearing this, that would be a blessing. Come to the Lord or closer to the Lord. Because I tell you, authentic Christianity, let me also mention, when I saw authentic Christians, that also wasn't offensive to me. It was mysterious. I didn't understand, but it was not offensive. I was offended by the, the fakers, the posers, the same ones we're all offended by. Yes, we all find that offensive. But authentic Christianity and people in relationship with Christ is not offensive. And so those who are here or listening who maybe don't know, you're feeling what I'm saying. You've experienced it. I remember, uh, or just I heard recently, like we're involved in Ukraine right now. Um, Convoy of Hope, why do we do what we do? Well, part of the how is we feed over 500,000 kids in 29 countries. We're empowering women, taking them from nothing to middle income jobs, training farmers to increase their crops, and take care of their own kids. We also last year responded to 64 disasters. This year we're in Ukraine, nine countries in Ukraine, with uh, two warehouses, one in Poland and one in Romania. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're there through churches, through relationships we already had. We were able to step in and step up right away, you know, to give a hand up, not a hand out, to help right away, move people. Um, we're also responding to the floods in St. Louis and Kentucky that you see. So when you go to work tomorrow or wherever you go tomorrow or when you meet other people, you could tell them, hey, the church I'm part of, we're responding to Ukraine. We're responding to those floods in Kentucky because you are. You guys are financial partners and givers to Convoy of Hope and through Convoy of Hope. And with full confidence, I'll tell you, you, we are responding, helping others. What a great way to compassionately evangelize, different than inviting somebody to church to say, we are literally our church here in Linwood is helping the people in Ukraine. And somebody's going to say, how's that? Oh, through our involvement and partnership through Convoy of Hope, we're able to serve people. And you could direct them. There's plenty of videos on the website and stuff like that. That's just compassionately sharing. Please, at a minimum, do that. That's fulfilling the why of what the Lord's called you to do. Uh, Irina is a woman in Ukraine who has three kids. The war started on her birthday. And... The next day, she had to leave her house. So she's like us. Can you imagine if you go home this afternoon and something happened where you had to leave your house with just a suitcase? That's literally what happened to thousands and thousands of people. She left her house with a suitcase and her kids, her three kids, the day after her birthday. I don't know how long it took her to get to the border, days. And then when she got to the border, her and her kids had to wait four days before crossing the border. Four days. And they were hungry and they were cold. And she was worried, how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to clothe my kids and keep them warm? And she was desperate. And when she crossed the border through the local church there, they got food, and they got blankets, and they got comfort, and they got care, and she got hope. Amen. So she got the stuff, but what she got was hope back and be able to sustain herself. You guys did this. We did this. Some of the ways we get our strength... Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace 
to help in the time of need. That's powerful. We just need to draw near and receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but often I don't draw near because I'm so busy doing it, trying to do it myself. And then at some point I draw near and I get the blessing of the Lord. And as you get older, maybe me, I say you, as I get older and get more spiritually stronger, I remember and I'm like, oh yeah, I should go do that. So then I'm not in the world as much or as long as I intended to and I go to the Lord. And when to battle well? It says we're supposed to battle well always. Battle well always. Always. And that could be exhausting, but the revelation tells us how, it, how it'll end. The battle is already won on our behalf. So the question you really have is, are you willing and available to fight the battles where you're at? Are you willing and available? And I will tell you, it's a big question. It's not a flipping question. You know, the first time I was asked, I was a new believer, am I willing and available? I was maybe a believer just a year or so, and I went to Saddleback Church. That's the church I went to, uh, found my faith at. It's in Southern California. I went there four years as a non-believer. Plus, just so you know, Pastor, I tithed all four years as a non-believer. Yeah, because I saw what they were doing in the community, and as a business guy, that was good ROI. I was able to support that, just being honest. It wasn't because the Bible told me to. I saw what they were doing with the money. But the Bible does tell us just to tithe and have faith. I've learned that since then. But we're at Anaheim Stadium. There's thousands of people there. And they gave us these big cue cards. And on one side it says, willing. And on the other side it says, available. Willing, available, willing, available. I refuse to hold up a card. <laughs> this <laughs> stiff-necked Jew <laughs> believing in Christ, I, I wasn't willing and available. I, I'm like, that's a big deal. You're telling me to say, Lord, I'm willing and available. I wasn't ready to say that. I knew enough that I wasn't ready to say that, even with thousands of people going willing, available, willing, available. That's big. It was six months later in my backyard looking up at the stars. I remember telling the Lord, okay, Lord, I'm willing and available now. I'm willing and available. And I got to tell you, you pray that, he's going to use you. <laughs> he's going to open some doors if you put on your God goggles and you tell him you're willing and available. Again, in James, but well, before I get to that, this, that's my alarm. Thank you. Thank you, honey. This world is messed up, folks. We know it. We can't ignore the pain and suffering, nor should we, but we can't live in that heartache all the time either. The question is, for me, and I think for you, is, how do we, do, in our everyday faith walk, battle well and live through this to the promise that God made to eternity? So how do we find joy in the suffering? Let me just say again, in James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and the steadfastness has its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Whew. Okay. That, that's a faith statement, too. I remember my father-in-law, before he passed, um, I asked him one time, and I don't even know what crisis it was, because we have so many crises, right? I mean, we're in the Ukraine crisis now. But it was a few crises ago, and I was overwhelmed with things of the world. I was like, wow, it's terrible. And I said, Dad, I said, um, are we in the end times? And he looked at me and said, we're definitely in your end times. And I was like, oh, thank you, Mr. Theologian. I was looking for something a little more. But, you know, th but when I thought about it, he's absolutely right. I don't know if we're in the end times, but we're certainly in your end times and my end times. So I don't have to spend that much time personally in the end times. I need to focus on my end times and what has the Lord called me to do and us to do now in our end times. Amen? So that's what we are. Are we willing and available? Um, my father-in-law, I was at his bedside in January. So um, like I said, I was married to my wife nine and a half years before I even started seeking the Lord. So here's this man of God. His daughter marries this reluctant, rebellious Jew who's been married twice before with two kids from a previous marriage that doesn't believe in Jesus. 
tell me, every leader has issues, right? It's, no one's immune. No one's immune. You know, your leader here, you know, I'm, I, am, uh, I have a men's group that I'm part of, my church. Uh, before I tell you what my father-in-law said, my wife and I, uh, 30 years, I just want to be real with you, 30 years, oh, you know, we go through a couple seasons, a couple times a year of miscommunication. I don't know if any of you are surprised by that, miscommunication. So what do I mean? We were on a three-day drive recently, and day two, I don't know why day two of a three-day drive is always the toughest, with, at least in my family. And uh, we're like two hours into this eight-hour drive, and we have this conversation where we're like stuck in a washing machine. You ever get in this conversation where I say one thing and she repeats what I say and it's exactly not what I said and I tell her that's not what I said but she tells me that is what I said. Then we start arguing about this 40 minutes later. We're still arguing about who said what and when and it's going around in a circle. We're in the washing machine cycle and I can't get out. I can't get to the next cycle. So I see what's happening there and finally I just say, I'm done. She goes, what do you mean? I'm, I'm done talking? I'm not talking anymore. I'm done. Because anything I said wasn't happening. And, she go, and then she got mad at me because I was done. Because she wasn't done. But I was done. She wasn't done. So we had another 10 minutes of cycling around that. She goes, well, what do you mean you're done? And we went back and forth. Finally, I'm done. I dig my heels in. Psh, silence. And she looks at me and she goes, yeah? Well, what are you going to do for yourself about this? So she doesn't know because I actually was silent for the next two hours, stewing in my manliness. But uh, it was a great question. What am I going to do about my situation in this battle front I'm on right now? And I realize I can pray and I can get counsel from godly men or somewhere else. And I was actually getting, but I don't want to go to my godly men either and just have a downbeat conversation about my wife. But I actually reached out to a counselor and talked to the counselor. And I made an appointment. I go to this counselor, Christian counselor, just being real here. And I tell him everything I'm doing. I tell him all that. I tell him I go to church. I'm in men's groups. I talk to this. I meet with my pastor. Da, 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 da. He listens to everything I have to say. And he goes, oh, well, it kind of sounds like you're doing everything you should be doing. And I said, yeah, you're right. I am, I am doing everything. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> and I went home, and my wife and I started communicating again. So I don't know. Did some great magic revelation thing happen there? No. It didn't. It was just helping me in my faith walk to battle well. And sometimes we need help from others. The body of Christ, we need help. Yeah, amen. And you have that here. Uh, my father-in-law, when he was passing, and I'll try and wrap this up. I only have 30 pages left. <laughs> but I'll cut down to like two. <laughs> when he was passing, I was at his bedside. I started to say that earlier. And... Um, I was, my mother-in-law was sleeping on like a lounge chair nearby. I was there 8.30 in the morning. I knew my wife and brother-in-law were coming in about a half an hour. But uh, the nurse, uh, when I was in the hallway, she said, hey, I think he only has about a half hour. We were talking about like that night, what's he going to do? But then one comes in and says he has, a, I think, a half hour. So I call my wife and brother-in-law and tell them, get over here. And I go there, and I'm at his bedside. I don't wake my mother-in-law. And I have him by his arm and I get on my knees and I'm holding his arm and I start singing. Oh my Jesus, oh sweet Jesus, oh my Jesus. I just wanna tell you there was a time in my life where I couldn't even say Jesus' name out loud. Oh, my Jesus. And I hear him sigh. And I think that's when he went to be with the Lord. And I sat there and I thought, I believe because what this man and others have allowed me to experience, I believe and I can sing out Jesus' name right now. He's in heaven. I don't believe because of what I read. I don't believe because of what I've seen. I believe because of what people have afforded me to experience. And yesterday, we afforded people an opportunity to experience Christ through the drive-through and prayer. Whether they got prayer or not, they, they felt you. 
I, I believe it was felt. The community feels that. Even we don't have to understand things we feel. You know, we, we want to grow to it. So I'm thankful for that. So my hope for you guys is to be moved compassionately closer to Christ. Pray. If you're available, are you willing just to be poured into so you can be poured out of? In John 3.16, it says again, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Thank you, Lord. And then, the battle already being won, how do we fight well together? Unity in Christ. And I don't want to forget this because this is your church. Philippians 2, 1 through 5 states, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the Charisma family. Unity in Christ. And for those of you who maybe haven't accepted Christ yet or don't know or need a refresher, unity of the body is important. And for those of you online, uh, yes, unity. But I also want to caution, because I can get comfortable too, too comfortable watching online sometimes. And maybe you have to watch online. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But it's kind of like watching a nice swimming pool. And if you come to church, it's kind of getting in the swimming pool. So um, don't do that. You need that. We all need that. So let me end with this. <clears throat> let me go to the last page and end with this. Our win is beating death and eternity in heaven. Therefore, we could have great confidence. In 2 Timothy, it says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. I know, like my father-in-law is right now in heaven, waiting to greet me. I have full confidence, full confidence in that. And that's amazing. When it's all said and done, why are we battling at all? This is very simple and completely to spend eternity in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. This, is, this isn't it. That's it. It's simple. Not always easy, but it's simple. In your everyday faith walk, all this stuff is going on, but simply love Christ and share with others. We can do this. You can do this. And also, the union of Christ, if you're like me, I don't want to be overwhelmed with things of the world but I don't want to ignore it either because I'm afraid if I ignore it because it could hurt sometimes. You know, when we see the pain and this and that, sometimes we want to just not participate. That's a good pain. That's compassion. That's suffering with. But to have that compassion, you need spiritual strength. You need strength that's greater than our own, and you get that through the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me pray for you guys. Father, Lord, thank you, Jesus. I and we want to battle well, Lord. In our everyday walk of faith, we choose you, Lord Jesus. Some people are here for the first time or new or watching online or whatever. They made a choice. Whoever's hearing this made a choice to listen to this for whatever reason or be part of this for whatever reason. That's a choice. And now that that choice is made in the battle between good and evil, we want them on this team. God's winning team, Lord, but also they're so unique. You're so beautifully unique and blessed. The devil is never going to stop trying to get you back on his team. Therefore, you're going to have battles. It's not easy street, life at the beach. It's battles, but find joy in the suffering and battle well. Lord, I pray that we're willing and available. And today, Lord, as we go out, whatever you have even today, Lord, let us have our God goggles on. Let us not be weary, Lord. Let us look for opportunities that if you put something in front of us that we're available to just share your love in whatever that aspect is. We don't need all the answers, Lord. We don't have all the answers. We don't have to be the scriptural genius and have all the scripture to support it. It's your story. 
It's our story, Lord. So whatever Christ is doing in our lives, Lord, in your lives, through us, Lord, please, I pray that whoever's hearing this will just share what you're doing in their life. It's that simple, Lord. We love you and we love others. And whether we understand or not, we just want to share what's happening in our life, Lord. The good, the bad, the real, but the why is cause of you, Lord. And the how is just all the process, but the why is cause of you, Lord, to move one more closer to you so we could spend eternity in heaven with you. Be with us today. In your son Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you.